Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for the wonder of your love and your kindness to us. We ask that this morning you would help us simply to, to hear your voice and to be yielded to what you want to do in our hearts and our lives. And Lord, we give you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, welcome to Jesus' name. You guys can be seated. Welcome to everybody listening on the radio and online. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, tonight we're going to have our home fellowship, and that's at uh, 6 o'clock at the Schubert's home. And uh, all you guys are invited. Uh, it's basically going to be focused on kind of getting the group ready to go to Israel in, uh, in March. But it's not limited to that group because we're going to be doing a lot of different Bible studies about different sites and different places and stuff. And, uh, and we're going to try and actually um, uh, get that out on Facebook Live tonight, too, for people that are coming on the trip that are living in other areas that can't be here tonight. And so it starts at 6, and, uh, and there's, no, uh, there's no potluck dinner connected to it, just so you know, because a few people are going, all right, we're going to have dinner there. So no, we're not. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so show up at 6, and we'll have a great time. And then uh, this morning's service, we're going to kind of focus on uh, communion service. I'm looking forward to doing that this morning. And then uh, Tuesday, we've got the men's study. Uh, that starts at 6 o'clock here at church, and we're going through the book of 1 John. Uh, inductively, and we're also uh, going through a book called The Disciplines of a Godly Man, uh, which is a really good study, and and there's copies of that book out on the counter if you want that. And then uh, this Friday uh, is the uh, Christmas dinner here at church. It starts at 6 o'clock, and it's basically just an opportunity to get together and have uh, fellowship and uh, together and uh, and think about what the Lord's done for us in in his uh, uh, nativity and Advent and all that stuff. Anyway, there's a sign up on the counter. If you want to come, please come. the church is going to provide the, uh, the main dish, uh, uh, turkey and ham. Then you guys bring a side dish or dessert or whatever, and uh, we'll have a great time together. And then uh, also just kind of a, uh, a community notice kind of thing. Uh, December 14th and 15th, uh, the, the Susanville Symphony is uh, conducting Handel's Messiah. And uh, it's just really cool to listen to it because of all the scripture uh, built into the lyrics and everything. And so uh, anyway, uh, I just kind of, I, I would go if I wasn't doing something else. I got to go to something else. But anyway. Um, on December 20th, which is a Thursday evening, uh, the ladies are having the Women's Sock Exchange. And, uh, and that's just a, a new town fellowship for the ladies. And uh, you're supposed to bring uh, uh, a pair of socks, not, not wearing them, but just like an extra pair of socks to give away. And, uh, and then uh, cookies. Uh, it's like a cookie exchange kind of a scenario. And so uh, that starts at 7 o'clock. That's at the Schufert's house. And, uh, and if you need more information, Deb Schufert's sitting right there. And, uh, and then there's stuff on the counter, I think. And then uh, Friday, December 21st, uh, we're going to go Christmas caroling, and what we do is uh, we gather here at 5.30, and then we go to a couple of the different uh, uh, retirement-type homes and stuff, and, uh, and basically, uh, we sing Christmas carols up and down the hallways, and uh, it blesses them, uh, and it's so cool. I mean, a lot of these people don't get visitors very often or whatever, and so we go through singing Christmas carols and talking with them and praying with them. Uh, it's just a neat time of ministry, and so I hope you can come out for that. And then on Monday, December 24th, we're going to have our Christmas Eve candlelight service. And uh, that's always a lot of fun. And so uh, that's at 7 o'clock here at the church. And then the following week, December 31st, New Year's Eve, is our New Year's Eve prophecy update. It starts at 7 o'clock as well. And, and that's always an exciting time because it's a, it's a great time to kind of collect together a lot of the events through the year and, and things that are going on in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, Israel is God's timepiece. And so if you're at all curious about prophetic events and what's going on and what's about to happen because Jesus is coming soon and, uh, and it's one of the things you get excited about when you come to that. So that starts at uh, 7 o'clock here at church. But um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for, for giving us uh, air in our lungs and love in our hearts just to worship you. And so guide us in that, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for being with us this morning, Lord, for being present in our midst and for beckoning us, Lord, into your presence. We ask, Father, that you be glorified in this, in this time today. So we remember you, Lord, as we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hey, why don't you turn and say hello to each other real quick. All right. Well, as you can see, it's time to pray for the uh, kids going off to Sunday school and nursery. All right. You got reinforcements on the way? One more coming. Hey, Cameron. All right. Come on up, buddy. All right. Well, Father God, Lord, we thank you for these awesome kids. And Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon them today, Lord, that you would bless them and strengthen them, Lord, and pour out your spirit upon them. May they have hearts that are willing to receive, Lord, your, your instruction, Lord, and guide them, Lord, to learn how to walk with you and to talk with you. So bless them, Father, and, and bless those that will be ministering to them. Lord, may they simply reflect your love and your joy to these kids. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, careful going down. Exactly. That's the brute squad today. Hey, this morning we're going to, um, well, I'll just tell you up front, we're going to be reading from Isaiah 52 as we start off on our, our reading this morning. And uh, the service is really going to focus on uh, communion and remembering our Lord's sacrifice for us. And so... Um, Isaiah 52, we're going to read from verse 14 through almost the end of uh, chapter 53, and then we'll get into the, uh, the actual study. But once you get your Bibles open to Isaiah 52, if you're able, uh, would you stand with me in reverence for God's Word as we read it together? Isaiah 52, <clears throat> we're going to pick it up at verse 14. Here Isaiah records for us. In verse 14, just as many as were astonished at you, so his, his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what they had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Who is believed or reported? To whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall go up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. <coughs> he was led as a, slam, as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and, the, and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. 
We thank you for this description of what our Lord went through, Lord, really on our behalf. And we ask this morning that you would give us a greater appreciation, Lord, of your sacrifice, a greater understanding of the depth, really, of your love for us, and help us to hear your voice all the more clearly. We thank you, Lord, and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. You can be seated. I'd actually intended this morning uh, <clears throat> to continue in our trek through the Bible and just kind of study through Proverbs and then kind of, you know, uh, tack, if you will, uh, the communion service on to the end of the study. But I realized as I studied through Proverbs and I realized as I was praying about uh, the communion service itself that I couldn't do both justice. And so this morning we're just really going to focus on uh, uh, the communion aspect of things and just remembering what our Lord has done for us. But one of the things that kind of uh, jumped out at me as I was studying through Proverbs 15 was the fact that the word but, uh, B-U-T, is, uh, is used 22 times uh, in that one proverb. And uh, 22 times it portrays a contrast, a, a contrast between the righteous and, and the wicked, uh, between the wise, the prudent, and the humble, and the foolish, the perverse, and the proud. Uh, between really, if you think about it, between the believer and the non-believer. And so uh, the real difference between the two is the blood of Jesus, uh, between those who are born of the Spirit and those who are born of the flesh. And <clears throat> Jesus kind of describes this in his conversation uh, with Nicodemus, uh, a religious leader of his day, uh, as he's talking to him about uh, the truth of God, if you will. In John chapter 3, uh, verse 3, Jesus said to him, Most assuredly, or verily, verily, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus point blank, unless you're born again of the Spirit, you will not see the kingdom of God, which means you will essentially go to hell. And so being born again is a matter of life and death. Um, in verse 5, uh, Jesus continued that conversation said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so he's drawing the distinction uh, between those two things, and that which is born of the flesh. That's how every one of us comes into this world. We're born of the flesh. We're, we're born uh, by blood and water uh, into this world, if you will. And we are fleshly creatures. Um, we, we don't have the spirit of the living God living in us. Um, one day, hopefully, we come to understand the gospel and, and we see our need. We confess our sins and ask Jesus to come into our lives and we come, become born again of the spirit. And that's a second birth. Um, uh, the Bible describes the second birth. Jesus talks about that as being born again of the spirit again, uh, being born again the second time. And, and the gospel is very simple. We are all sinners by nature. Uh, that's just who we are. And, and even if you're, uh, you know, a, a big sinner or a little sinner or whatever you think, you know, when I was a, a practicing Roman Catholic, uh, they had degrees of sin. You know, these are the, the, the average minor ones, and these are like the big ones, and that's the ones you can't ever get over kind of thing. And, uh, and you know, the, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin, singular, is death. It just takes one, you know. And so uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. And, you know, I like the clarity of that statement. I don't have to be a theologian to figure out what no means and not one, uh, none righteous. I mean, we're all pretty much in the same club. Again, in Romans 3.23, he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, you can do uh, a big study if you want on the word all, uh, but you'll find out in the end of it is it means all. That uh, means everything. There aren't any exceptions or exclusions to that. Uh, we are all sinners. And so we've fallen short of the glory of God. We've fallen short of really the standard of God, uh, which is perfection. Uh, Paul tells us again in Romans 5.8 that God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I didn't always appreciate the depth of the meaning of this particular verse. You know, that before, before we were saved, before we knew God, while we were living our lives really at enmity with God, in opposition to God, that God still loved us anyway, and he loved us to the point where he would actually send him, himself, send his son, to die for us on a cross. He would die a, a, a gruesome, a horrific kind of a death, but he would do it intentionally for us. Now, 
I'm, you know, uh, I, I try to understand the love of God and, and, and to fathom the depth of it and the commitment that God makes and, you know, the, the selfless agape love of God that expects nothing in return. But I have a hard time relating to that because everybody I love pretty much loves me. You know, I love my wife and, and she loves me and there's times when I, and, and I love my kids and, and, and they love me back. And, and there's times, you know, there's people around us that we choose to love, whether it's a spouse or a family member or a neighbor or a friend. You know, and sometimes you, you develop friendships or relationships with people that aren't romantic in nature, but they're, they're people that you just really have that kind of camaraderie and, and those kinds of things. And you love those people. And you find as you examine those kinds of relationships, more often than not, it's because they love you too. You know, it, it, it's reciprocal in some way. Yet God, in his, in his infinite love and his, his incredible grace, loved us when we were at odds with him, when we were his enemy. You know, uh, sometimes there, there's those spontaneous acts of love. You know, you see, read about a, a soldier on the battlefield that perhaps... Uh, would give his life for his comrades, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll jump on that grenade kind of scenario, spontaneous, it just kind of happens, and it's a heroic moment. But it's something else for, for them to know ahead of time that's coming. Jesus knew from the beginning of time what would take place, what would happen, and he did it anyway. And he, he knew that we would be the ones to spit in his face, that we would be the ones to drive the nails in his hands, and he died for us anyway. And to me, this is just, uh, it, it accentuates his incredible love for us. And, and again, knowing that the standard is perfection, and we've all fallen short of that, and we're incapable of achieving that standard in and of ourselves. We, we need the help of God to do that. Paul tells us also that uh, in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. The, the earning of sin, the result of sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. And that's what we deserve. And the Bible seemingly talks more about hell than it does heaven. Jesus describes hell as being a place of eternal torment, a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and uh, where the flame doesn't ever finish burning us and where the worm never stops eating us and all those different kinds of things. And, and you read the different uh, uh, descriptions of hell and it's like you wouldn't want your worst enemy to go there. And, and Jesus, God, does not want us to go there either. That's why he came and he he, he provided a sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice before God so that we wouldn't have to go to hell, that we could have an option, you know, to, 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 to be with him forever in heaven. And, and it, that's really the essence of the gospel is that we were condemned to hell. And the good news is that Jesus came to take our place. And if we'll just accept his atoning sacrifice, then we too can have a place in heaven with him forever in eternity. And, I, you know, I... I didn't have to think too hard about whether I was a sinner or not. I mean, I'd seen that clearly that I was a, a sinner and that and I was, from my religious upbringing, I was very much afraid of going to hell. My, the problem with my religious upbringing was it, while it taught me that the gut, heaven and hell were real and God is real and I figured out that I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell, I couldn't figure out how to get to heaven. I couldn't figure out how to fix my problem until someone shared the gospel with me, until someone, you know, came with God's word and explained to me what the, what the deal really was. And I tell you what, I was overjoyed to get saved. I was really, really, really happy not to be going to hell anymore. And I'm still very happy about that. People ask me all the time, hey, man, how you doing? Well, you know, I got Jesus in my heart and I'm going to heaven. <laughs> you know? and I, every day is a good day because I'm not going to hell. And, I, and one day I get to be with him. And, and, and one of the things is that as as Jesus, who was God, contemplated what it would take for us to not have to be condemned eternally, when, when Jesus considered the, the price that would be paid, for us, it, it's, it's a free gift in a sense. You know, Jesus paid the price. It's free to us, but it cost him dearly. I, I think about when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was, you know, he was moving towards the cross, if you will, uh, approaching even those, those final moments, and, and it led up to the Garden of Gethsemane, where at one point, with his disciples, he said, you know, you guys hang out here. Uh, I'm going to go pray. Pray for me. And, and, you know, it's pretty interesting when God asks you to pray for him. You know, when I ask you to pray for me, it's because I, you know, like sometimes ahead of time, I know I'm about to face a difficult thing or a situation or whatever, uh, a, a tough counseling thing, you know, all kinds of things. And so I'll ask people, ask my wife, hey, would you pray for me? Usually when I ask someone to pray for me, it's because I know I'm about to head into the lion's den, you know, and, and I need it. And for Jesus to turn around, can you, can you find anywhere else in the Bible where God asks his children to pray for him? There's not one moment. 
it's the one time that I know of in the Bible where, you know, Jesus says, pray for me. And, and as Jesus goes and he begins to pray himself, he prayed with such an intensity that his sweat became like great drops of blood. Now, to me, that describes an intense situation. And, and what was so dramatic or stressful or crucial that Jesus would pray with such a fervency? And because he was praying about the cross, remember his prayer, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And what he's saying is, if there's any other way to accomplish what you're about to do, if there's any other way to do this besides what I'm about to do, would you do that? And we know that the answer that came from the Lord, you can look at this from a, from a deductive kind of standpoint, the answer was, there's no other way. We have to go through with this. But what was causing Jesus such a, 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 a stress or whatever? You know, I, stress is a bad word. God's never stressed. But I'm, I'm just trying to, I don't know how to explain it in human terms <clears throat> about the, the thing that Jesus was confronting. And, and one of the things he was confronting was that when he was on the cross, he would literally become the sin of all mankind. He would become sin. Now, this is someone who's never sinned. This is someone who was perfect and pure and holy and came to earth and lived a godly, holy life like none of us ever could. We wish we could, but none of us ever could or did. And when Jesus would become sin, literally he would be actually, for the first time in all of eternity, past, present, and future, he would actually be separated from the Father in some way. Because we read in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, that God's eyes are too pure to look upon evil. And when Jesus became pure evil, the Father, in a certain sense, had to turn away. And that's why you read in the, in the, in the Psalms and stuff about Jesus, I'm a worm, I'm not a man. You know, he, he realized that when he became sin that way, and this is something that, that obviously caused Jesus great, great concern to the point where he was praying so intensely, that, again, that this what became great drops of blood, but it's just the prospect of, and I don't know how long that lasted. Since reunited as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But even for a moment to think that, to contemplate that he would be separated from his heavenly Father, sometimes we take that same thing for granted. Sometimes we, we realize, you know, when you've been close to God, when you're walking with him and in the spirit, and you, just the, the joy of knowing that you're right in the center of his will, there's no, there's no better place to be in that, than that abiding kind of a relationship. That you have the assurance that even if you don't know what you're doing half the time, go, well, God, you'll guide me. You know, you just move forward and keep going and, and trust that God will do that. That's part of our, 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 our faith walk with him. But there's also those times we know that we're not quite maybe in the spirit the same way, that we've, we've allowed distance to grow between us or we've done something, uh, some sinful thing, whatever. And maybe we've, you know, th there's, a, there's two aspects to our relationship with God. One is uh, positional. We know that it, as Jesus died on the cross for our sins, his shed blood covers all of our sins, past, present, and future, and that God the Father sees us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so positionally in God, in Christ Jesus, we're pure, we're holy. It's like, wow, you know, that's awesome. But that's our position in eternity. That's our position in heaven. But there's also the practical aspects of life where I know in the back of my mind that I'm holy because God says I'm holy, but I'm still dealing with this body of sin and flesh and the, the things that I deal with every day. And sometimes I have a bad attitude. Sometimes I say the wrong word. Sometimes I, I'm not kind to people like maybe I should be or I, I blow up about something and lose my temper. Does it mean that we lose our salvation? It doesn't. It just gets to the point where we have to confess our sins and, 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 and come back to God humbly and ask him for forgiveness. And we're still, we're still in that positional place of we're saved because we're, we're born again. But now we're restoring that closeness that we have with God in a practical sense. And so we have to deal with, you know, kind of, in, there's that, in the back of your mind, you realize I'm saved, I'm good. But there's that part of me that says, but I want to stay good. <laughs> I want to do the right thing and, and walk the right way. And, 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 and so Jesus paid the price for that, but he knew that ahead of time that he was going to, I mean, he had all of eternity. This, this was not a, a last minute plan by God, you know, like, oh, I wonder what we'll do now. Oh, okay, we got it. No. Jesus knew from the beginning of time that the day that he'd be in the garden, the day that he would hang on the cross, the day that he would yield up his spirit and, and spend that time in the grave, if you will, he knew all that ahead of time and he faced it. It was not a spontaneous kind of heroic act it's even all the more heroic, I think, because he had time to think about it and did it anyway. And 
that's our Lord. You know, we read it earlier, and I want to reread it, but in Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, he says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. And it's the general idea, just kind of emphasizing the fact that he did not die for his own sins. He died for our sins. You know, he took our place on the cross. It, Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. He says, But he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. The thing about Jesus, and, and sometimes people will kind of minimize uh, his sacrifice. Well, he was God. You know, when Jesus came, the incarnation as a child, as a baby, we celebrate Advent for the same thing, the Advent of Christ. And, and when, when Jesus came, he was fully God still, yet fully man. And, and fully man, I believe, so that he could relate to us and so that we could relate to him. Because we'd say, well, you know, of course God doesn't sin. You know, God's up in heaven and he doesn't have to worry about, you know, paying his bills. He doesn't have to worry about, you know, going to the market and, and seeing what he sees in the newsstands or the different things, the temptations of life. He came and experienced, in a sense, all the temptations we ever experienced, yet without sin. And, and, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And can you imagine, I mean, just, you know, what it would be like to, to have that kind of track record? Well, I mean, it's not possible for any of us, but can you imagine getting to where you're 20 years old, 30 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, and never sin. And then one day, just that one slip up. You just said the wrong word, or someone stepped on your toe, or something happens, you know, and how bad you would feel to kind of mess up the perfect record. Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus, not just to have one sin to his account, but all the sin of all mankind heaped upon him at that very moment? And I'm not talking about the, the, the churchgoer that's just a nice person all day long and, and just lives up that one time. I'm talking about guys like Hitler and Stalin and mass murderers and, and wicked people and all that heaped on him. I can't imagine that. I, I, I think if you told me ahead of time, I, I don't think I would sign up for that. But Jesus did. And he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, in verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. In other versions say he emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. People have asked me some you know, trivia questions I've been mean, growing up as a kid. So if you had to die, how would you want to die? Well, you know, some people say, well, I, and I, I, when I was a kid, it was kind of funny. I said a volcano. Because in Southern California, there aren't any volcanoes. <laughs> I think, hey, volcano, that's great. I don't have to worry about it. Then I moved up where I'm like 50 miles away from a big volcano. <laughs> like, what do you tell me, God? But, you know, if I was going to pick my, my method of execution or my, the, my, my own demise, if you will, it certainly would not be the cross. It wouldn't be the most horrific, painful thing that invented by mankind to inflict pain and suffering on an individual, prolong it for days, and then they die, you know, a horrible, wretched kind of a death. That's not what I would choose. And yet, to make the point, that's what he suffered for us. He became obedient even to the point of death, even the death on the cross. That, <clears throat> in a certain sense, demonstrates the depth of his sacrifice and his love for us. I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I've been walking with the Lord for a number of years now, and I've been studying his word a lot, and I still can't figure out why he loves me. I, can't, I still can't figure out the depth of his love and his kindness to me and why he's so gracious to me. And there's times I sit back and I pinch myself and I, I almost want to cry. I say, God, I'm not, I'm not deserving of the least of your mercies. And yet you're so gracious to me and you're so merciful to me. And it's interesting that as he sat with his disciples on that, that fateful evening when he had the Last Supper with them, remember he got up at one point in the middle of dinner and he washed their feet? I'm thinking, man, you ever try to wash somebody else's feet? We had a group of kids in our youth group one time, and we just kind of surprised them and uh, set up a chair and uh, a bowl of water and stuff and towels, and, and the kids didn't know it was coming. And I sat there, and I invited the first person. I want you to sit down for a minute. And I what, what? You know, we're out on this, we're on a mission trip. We're out in the woods doing a bunch of stuff. 
And I, I, as I sat down, I started taking their shoes. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, because I'm always a jokester. So they're thinking I'm going to mess with them or something. And, uh, and I started peeling their shoes off and their dirty, grimy socks and stuff. And I started uh, washing, their, washing their feet. And they tried to stop me. And then one by one, as I was washing their feet, they each just broke down in tears. They couldn't believe that, you know, their youth leader, all that kind of stuff, whatever, would wash their feet. I can't imagine what it would have been like for the apostles that night when Jesus put that towel around himself and knelt down in front of them and began to wash their feet. And they're like, what? Because they all knew that was the the job of the the crummiest, the lowest man on the totem pole kind of slave, you know? And and, uh, it's like, what you, you know, we should be washing your feet. And to the point where Peter says, nah, yeah, I'm washing my feet. And Jesus says, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, man, we have nothing to do with each other. Wash my whole body. No. Positionally, you're clean. Practically, you need your feet clean today because you've been walking through the mucky streets. But Jesus would do that for his disciples. And, and that night, as he instituted the, the, the right, uh, I'm not sure if I would call it a ritual, but you know, the, the celebration of communion, what was it all about? It was all about remembering him, not forgetting I, you know, I thank God all the time. I think we should be, as a, as a group of people, as Christians, we should be thankful people. We should be, be thanking God for life and breath every day. We should be thanking him for the clothes on our back and cars that fire up, you know, and, and you know, gas in the car and all the things that God gives us. He gives us so much. And on top of that, he gives us salvation. He gives us eternity with him. We have a hope and a love and a joy and a peace that passes all understanding that the rest of this world doesn't know. I, I watch people walk around, they're, they're doped up, uh, they're legally and illegally, they're, 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 they're messed up, they're, they're stressed out, all kinds of things are happening in their lives. Why? Because they don't have hope. They're thinking that they're, they're getting to the end of their rope. And, and, and I've seen teenagers that think that they're at the end of their rope. You know, and, and life is not worth living, and, and that's why teen suicide is so high. Why? Because they don't have the hope of Jesus Christ in their heart. They don't realize that one day, whether you have a short life or a long life, that at the end of this long, short life that we have, I mean, you live 70 years or 100 years, what's that in comparison to eternity? That's a short life. But that it gets better in heaven with him? That, yeah, one day we'll get through all this stuff and, and we'll have to worry about the, the, the issues of life that we deal with that are so hard at times? That, and, and to know that it is right hand our pleasures forevermore. That in his presence we'll be rejoicing and singing praises to him and, and loving him back, if you will, responding to him. And that we can have that kind of a hope. And that's born out of an understanding that, that Jesus came and saved us. Saved us, past tense. That positionally, we're good with him. Practically, we're still working out our, our days and trying to be good and all that kind of stuff. But it, the whole idea is that we would not forget to be thankful. Because sometimes, again, we can kind of take some of these things kind of for granted. We maybe th- and I've done it many times where I thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for helping me with this or that, you know, for paying my bill or for, 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 for uh, blessing my kids or for healing my grandson or for the different things you've done in my life. And I'm thankful for that. But a week later, so what are you thankful for? And I'm like, uh, you know, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm trying to think real fast and kind of remember some of the things. That's why I, I, I keep a prayer journal. I'll go back through that thing every now and then. And I write down my prayer requests that I, that I pray, that we pray at men's prayer and everything. And, um, and I'm blown away when I go back over those things, how many of those prayers have been answered in the affirmative, how God has provided a job for somebody, how God healed people from cancer, you know, how, how God blessed our, our little fellowship, how we blessed the radio station, how people are hearing the gospel and different things are happening. And, and these are all blessings from God. And he's called us to remember. But, you know, what's the biggest blessing in your life? You can walk through and talk about you've got material things or you've got a good relationship with your spouse or you've got you know, awesome kids and different things like that. But I'll tell you what, I, I know the common denominator that binds all of us together. It's Jesus. He is the common denominator. He's what binds us together. And he is the biggest blessing in our life. And the smartest thing that any of us will ever do is surrender our hearts and our lives to Jesus. And I don't know when that happened for each of you individually. I remember the day it happened to me. I can't forget it. And I look back, and I think, for such an idiot, how did I make such a smart decision? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and, 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 I'll, and I'll be honest with you, 
I made that decision in relative ignorance because I did not understand completely the aspects of the gospel. All I knew was I didn't want to go to hell. And they said, if you, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips, you shall be saved. And I go, well, I need that. If you want to get right with God, this is what you do. I need that. And I'll be honest with you, I've spent the last 30 years figuring out what I did. <laughs> I've been studying and reading and going, ah, oh, okay, now I get it. I didn't necessarily get it all the way then. It was truly a leap of faith for me, as it wasn't as I'm sure it was for each of you. And God has simply called us not to forget that. To put it in the forefront of our minds and to remember every day. I mean, we celebrate communion at our church, you know, on the first Sunday of the month, and that's just kind of what we do. But there's some churches that do it every single Sunday. And, and, and there's churches that are open that have the elements out that every single day of the week you can come in and you can kind of have that quiet time with the Lord and, and celebrate communion. I think that's awesome too. And, and, you know, there's nothing that stops you from doing it at home. Quite honestly, I, guys, get your family together. If you're here and there, you know, and, and bring them together and read through some of the scriptures and stuff and, and have community together as a family. Tell you what, it, it's what binds us together as a family, as a church family, and it will bind your family together as a family family. And it's an awesome thing to do that because it's honoring to God. And quite honestly, that's, that was the determining factor this morning because usually we have our community services in the evening, we just dedicate a service to that. And when we do it in the morning service, there's a lot of times I'm like, I want to keep going through the Bible, I want to keep studying, you know, so I try to kind of maybe split it up, and I thought, no, I can't do that. We're going to spend this time with the Lord. We're going to read through a few different passages. We're just going to read them through. And, and it kind of lays out, uh, you'll see it as we go. We're going to start off in Psalm 32. And I just encourage you, as I call out the scriptures, turn there, follow along with me as I read. And then, uh, and then we'll, 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 we'll progress with this. But we're going to start off anyway in, uh, in Psalm 32. And I'm going to read verses uh, uh, 1 through 5. And all this, the intent of all this, is simply to put our minds and our hearts in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. And as we do that, as we read through these scriptures, I, I'd like you to make it a point to not think so much about what Jesus did for the church corporate. It's true, he did it for the church corporate. But he did it for each of you individually, for me individually. As you read through these scriptures, I want you to remember, and maybe in your hearts to acknowledge, to somehow personalize this and know he did this for you. Okay? It's not just a general kind of a statement. In, uh, in Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5, <clears throat> this is... Uh, David saying, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. The word blessed there, as you read this, it's also translated as, Oh, how happy is the man. And when you know that your sins are forgiven, when that, that thousand pound weight's been lifted off your shoulders, you're happy. You're blessed. You're overjoyed. Verse 3, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. And what David, he, you see the contrast here? The first two verses, it, he's blessed, he's happy, he, he's, he's enjoying the fruit of forgiveness, if you will. But in the next two verses, he's describing the agony of bearing that sin in his own heart. That time when, when David was kind of keeping his sin with Bathsheba secret, when the murder of Uriah was heavy on his heart, but he couldn't tell anyone about it. And it was eating him alive. He, he felt dead on the inside. And, and sometimes we feel the same way when we're, when we're being separated from God, when we're being distant from him because of the, the, the practical issues that we deal with on a, on a, on a daily basis sometimes. And, and David said it, it was drying him up. My vitality, my life was turned into the drought of summer. Then verse 5 goes back the other direction. Uh, there's no word but there, but he says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity have I not hidden, meaning he confessed it. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. To understand that you are forgiven. To understand that before God Almighty, you have a clean slate. You have a fresh start. And, and David sensed the joy of that. And I, and I think that we should each 
comprehend to some degree the joy of just being able to walk forward in the Lord and knowing that we're forgiven, that he looks at us as holy and pure. What a, <laughs> I tell you what, when you got some baggage, like I had some baggage, man, you look back and you don't want to look back, but when you know that it's all gone, that you're not dragging that around anymore, what a, what a blessing that is. Turn forward to the right to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 17. This is really the fruit of brokenness in David's life. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Notice that David isn't saying, forgive me because I'm so good. Forgive me because I'm your chosen one. I'm your fair-haired child. I'm the one that you like so much. Forgive me because I'm a man after your own, own heart. No. He's saying, forgive me, Lord, because of who you are, because of your character, because of your, your love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. It's the idea here that when we confess our sins, and later on, he says that how, how God requires truth in the inward parts. When we confess our sins, we're being reconciled to God on different levels at the, at the same moment. Back in uh, the book of Joshua, when uh, Joshua confronted Achan about stealing the, the clothing and the gold and all that kind of stuff, and he confronted uh, Achan, he says, give God the glory and confess your sin. Now, what's, what we understand from confession is that when we confess our sins to God, we're actually giving him glory. That's certainly what Joshua would say. Why is that? Because God has known all along what we did. He knew all along that it was wrong. But we, in our own mindset, went ahead and did whatever we did and just kind of said, well, I'm going to do this. And whether it's accidental, a sin, or intentional, a transgression, we just kind of do it. And in the process, ignore God. And in the process of time, when we don't confess our sin, what we're implying is, and what I did was right, because that's why I did it. But when we finally get to the point where we confess it to God, that is truth in the inward parts. We're saying, you know what, God? You were right all along, and I was wrong, and I'm acknowledging that now, and I'm giving you the glory because you knew all along. So when we confess our sins, it is giving glory to God, but it's also clearing the slate. It's also coming to a place of brokenness and truthfulness with God. And I found in my own life, in my own walk with the Lord, that God always brings me to a place of brokenness. He always brings me to a place of truth in the inward parts where I finally kind of have to admit my fear, my lack of faith, my lack of faithfulness or whatever, my sin. And when I, when I get to that point, seemingly that's when God speaks to me the most. That's when he works in my heart the most. And that's when I move forward in my relationship with the Lord the most. And so God brings us to that place. And so David's describing exactly that. He says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you make me to know wisdom. He says, Purge me or, or cleanse me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken. Now, this, is, this speaks to the intensity of what David was going through. The, the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Sometimes we need a heart change more than anything. He says, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. This one line in verse 11, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. There's a song that we sing that, that, that repeats the same words. And I ask myself, why did David include these words in this particular psalm? Because, you know, I think about it as a New Testament Christian, when we become born again, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, that's it. I mean, it's like, it, that, that's a forever thing. But back in the Old Testament dispensation of things, there were times when God would pour out his spirit upon somebody, and then they would, he would withdraw his spirit at times. And, and David and King Saul were two different kings. Saul was a bad king. Saul was a fleshly man, and, and God used him for a season. There was a season when God poured out his spirit upon Saul, and Saul prophesied, and, and Saul did some pretty good things. But there came a point in time when Saul rejected the word of God, 
rejected the counsel of God, and God, what happened? God withdrew his spirit from Saul. And David saw that. And David thought to himself, I've committed adultery, I've committed murder, I've lied, I've done all these things. God, would you forgive me? God, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your presence from my life. I want to be with you so much. There's nothing I desire more than being in your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And David, I'm sure, cried that prayer out and prayed that prayer out so intently. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your, your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. I'm going to talk about you, Lord, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you didn't desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You didn't delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. We have to be careful is this couple, last couple of verses, 16 and 17, kind of speak to us. It says, he, God doesn't want sacrifice in the sense of a, a rote, religious, ritualistic kind of a sacrifice. What he wants from us is heartfelt, sincere thanks. He wants us to appreciate what he's done, and it would be the, the farthest thing from religious observance. And, you know, because we do engage uh, in the, the rite, if you will, of communion, and because we do it on, on a semi-regular basis, We've got to be careful that when we do it, it's from our heart and that we truly appreciate what God has done for us. You know, I, I still think about his rebuke to the Ephesian church. You know, he said all kinds of good things about the Ephesian church, but he said, I got this one thing against you. You know, you've left your first love. And we want to be sure in everything we do that he is our first love and that we do it because we love him. Turn, if you will, now to the, farther to the right to First John. First John. And um, <clears throat> we're going to read uh, most of this chapter. It's only 10 verses long, but the first nine verses. But the idea of confession, the idea of giving God glory, uh, the idea truly of being right with God. Uh, in First John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and, and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which, is, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Part of the uh, purpose and intent behind confession in general is restored fellowship with God. Jesus came and sacrificed himself that we could have that restored fellowship with God, that we could be with him forever in eternity. That was his plan. And as part of that, we need to keep short accounts with God, that we need, you know, when we rec recognize our sin, and sometimes we know going into it, <laughs> you may as well just confess ahead of time before we even do something. It's like, okay, Lord, I'm about to do this, you know. And uh, maybe he'll stop you, but the point is, a restored relationship with him. And, and, and that was his intent, that we would have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And so I, I back up a little bit. When God is light, that means he is holy. He is pure. There's... There's no, there's no sin in him at all because it implies that the darkness is sin. When we walk in darkness, when we walk in sin, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and that is so true. Then in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's, that's the very thing that we got out of Psalm 32 earlier. That I came to you, Lord, I confessed my sin, and you forgave me. And God is so faithful and so dressed. You know, when, when Jesus said, you know, come to me, come unto me, all you that labor heaven, you know, his arms are open wide. I know at times that uh, my kids are afraid to come talk to me. They're afraid to ask something or to, 
you know, whatever. They don't want to for different reasons. And, and sometimes it's, a, it's the intimidation factor because I'm so intimidating. And, uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes people don't go to God for the same reasons. They go to God thinking, well, I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't go to God. I, I've met people, I can't go to church. You don't know what kind of a sinner I am. So I, I'm just going to assume you're the worst kind of sinner, and, and, and that maybe that's why you should come to church. But that's why we should approach God as well, because his arms are open wide, and he wants to hear from us. And so if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The next thing I want to do, if you'll turn uh, to the left now, to uh, Matthew chapter 26, I simply want to read through uh, the, the, the crucifixion account. It's the point in time, uh, Matthew 26, we're going to pick it up at verse 26. And Jesus, the narrative here starts out uh, at the tail end of the Last Supper. And then it walks us through, this is just Matthew's account, walks us through uh, the events leading up to and including uh, the crucifixion itself. And again, all of this is what the, the, the point is that we would kind of remember and appreciate aspects of what Jesus did for us and that we would not forget. And so part of that is, in my mind, a, a, a kind of a, a repetitive thing. I oftentimes, when we're going through these services, uh, you know, today I'm reading through Matthew. Uh, the next time I get together and do something like this, uh, I'll be reading through Luke's account. Time after that, it's through uh, all the Old Testament accounts and Isaiah and the Psalms and everything. And then, guess what? I kind of shift back to, to Matthew because I really believe that as we read God's Word and reread God's Word, uh, he illuminates different aspects of it to our hearts and to our minds, and it's impressed in our hearts, you know, and, and that we would not forget. And so that's the goal, that we would not forget. And so Matthew chapter 26, picking it up now at verse 26. And as, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and, and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Uh, and he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as, as you will. Then when he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, he said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Uh, now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one who sees him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, uh, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of uh, those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I can now pray and my father and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? And, and 
how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And when he laid hold of, when they laid hold of Jesus, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance uh, to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and the council sought false testimony against Jesus uh, to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. Uh, but at the last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, uh, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with their palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Now Peter sat outside the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also are with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he'd gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and, and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came and, and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, uh, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus that he'd said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out, and he wept bitterly. When the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. When they bound him, uh, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, the, the betrayer, his betrayer, seeing that uh, he, he had been condemned, he was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and, and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and, and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore that field has been called the, the field of blood to this day. Then, were fulfilled the, the, uh, then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was uh, priced, and uh, whom, they, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for the potter's field, and as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner, uh, whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Uh, therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? Uh, for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him, saying, I have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas, and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, uh, uh, Do you want me to release to you? Uh, they said, uh, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, 
I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and, and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and, and they bowed the knee before him and, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. When they'd mocked him, they, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And, and when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, uh, they gave him a sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he tasted it, he would not drink. And then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they each kept watch over him there, and they put over his head uh, the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And when they had passed by, uh, and those that passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and the elders, said, uh, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he's the king of, the, uh, king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe him. Uh, he trusted in God, let him also deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Uh, let, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, coming out of the graves after his resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. All I can say is amen to that. Jesus went through and endured all that we just read and all that we've been describing. <coughs> Paul writes to the Corinthians in, in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, For he, who made, for he made him to, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We talked earlier about how he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that all the sin of mankind was heaped on Jesus so that the righteousness of Jesus might be heaped on us. And the, the, the word that's used is imputed. Our sins were imputed to Christ. He was given credit for that. But then his righteousness was imputed back to us so that from a positional standpoint, God sees us as righteous. I tell you, I look in the mirror and I don't see righteous. I see handsome, but I don't see righteous. Right. And it's, it's a step of faith to trust that we are righteous because of his blood. And we're reminded of that today. You shouldn't laugh so hard. In, um, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the, the whole world. As we're studying through Galatians on um, Wednesday night, the biggest issue that is being dealt with in, in, the, in the churches of Galatia, these are non-Jews, Gentiles, that have come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Other men, referred to as Judaizers, have come in, said, well, that's all fine and well, but you know, you've got you've to get circumcised, you've got to obey the kosher laws, you've got to start looking out for the Sabbath day and adding on these different religious requirements. And Paul is laying out very clearly, you know, that uh, no, you're saved by grace alone, by faith alone, and, and that you trust in the Lord. And 
the idea of the Old Testament law, it served a purpose. It was to, to drive sinners to the cross, essentially, to be our, our tutor, our schoolmaster. But at the same time, the righteous requirements of the law required that the Jews, not the rest of the world, the Jews, would offer up sacrifices for their sins. They would, they would bring in a lamb or a goat or a, a bull or something. They would lay their hand on the, on the head of the animal and confess their sins, imputing their sin to the animal. Then they would take that animal and they would kill it. They would cut its throat or whatever. They would bleed it out. They'd take the blood. They would sprinkle parts of it here and there. They would dump it out. They would take the meat. They would divvy that out. Part of it would burn on the altar. Part of it would give to the priest. Part of it given back to the worshiper. But the whole idea was that that was a kofar, K-O-F-A-R, a kofar, a temporary covering. Much like Adam and Eve in the garden. Those fig leaves they got were a temporary covering. God made them another covering of animal skins. Again, the covering for sin was temporary, but an animal had to die to provide that. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He is the permanent covering, if you will. That he's the, the one and only, the all-time, forever sacrifice for sins. There's no other sacrifice that needs to be made. In fact, if we try to add to that, what we're saying, what we're implying is that his sacrifice was insufficient, which is blasphemy. Okay? And so Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He's the final covering. Positionally, we're clean before the Lord. And right now, practically, we're dealing with stuff. But you know, one day, we're going to be back all the way with him. We're going to be called in the rapture. We're going to die. Whatever's going to happen, we're going to be in his presence. And we're going to be holy and pure as he is holy and pure. What a day that's going to be. Today, though, Today, we simply remember his sacrifice for us, what he's done for us. I want to uh, ask the worship team to come on up. When Paul conducted his services or his Bible studies, I'm not sure how they did that exactly, but when it came time to the communion table, Paul gave an admonition because he realized that, uh, you know, different cultures, different things do things differently. But the, the point is, is that he gave this admonition because he knew there would be non-believers in their midst. Now, I, I know just about everybody in this room, uh, but I don't know who's on the radio, who's listening on the internet. And so I'm going to be real careful uh, to give this admonition. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11:27, 27, Wherefore, whoever should eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Now, there's a twofold warning here, okay, admonition. One is to the non-believer. A non-believer should not partake of communion because communion is an act of remembrance. And we are remembering his sacrifice for us. And a non-believer doesn't have a, a dog in that fight, Right? So a non-believer shouldn't partake of communion because it's a sister. And I take this literally, there are those that were sick and died for doing that. Now the best solution is, if you're a non-believer in this room or listening on the radio, confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Admit your sins to him. Ask him to forgive you. Invite him into your heart and then partake of communion. That's the number one best solution. Second aspect of this, you know, that we should judge ourselves. And this morning, we have an opportunity. Once again, like 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. If we're, if we're dealing with a, a sin in our life, if we're doing something we know we shouldn't be doing, and you need to make it right with God, now's the, the best time. <laughs> Don't ever hesitate on that, but now's the best time. As we're passing out the elements and stuff, then take advantage of that and, and maybe do business with God. Get right with God if you need to. And then we'll have the elements. But if, if, if you're in the first category of a non-believer or whatever, then just let it pass by. Uh, because I want to be careful to abide by what God's word says. And so, uh, so we'll have that opportunity to, as we pass out the elements. Uh, uh, Jeff, would you help me pass out the elements, please? And John?
this piece of bread that you hold in your hands represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was broken for us. And the piece I'm holding is broken like yours, you know, from a larger piece. It's uh, burnt in part, scorched or scourged, pierced, broken. Jesus tells us that he is the bread of life, and, and he is. And that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And his body was broken and, and battered and bruised horribly. And by his stripes were healed. And Jesus commands us to be partakers of him. And so as we partake of him, we, as we, in a moment, ingest this bread, it becomes part of who we are. It, it's broken down and distributed every part of our body. And I pray that, that his presence would infiltrate every part of our body and of our hearts. But we do this as an act of remembrance. So when he'd given thanks, he broke the bread and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. represents the, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus, the same blood that ran from the wounds on his head, from the crown, and from the, the beating, the same blood that ran from his hands and his feet where he was pierced and nailed to that cross, the same blood that flowed down that cross into the dirt, the same blood that was pointedly given and shed for each of us that we might be covered in it, that his sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, would cleanse us from all of our sin. Leviticus tells us, in Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. I like the word atonement. Somebody told me one time that atonement, you can break it down, it means at one meant That through his blood we're made one with our God. The writer of Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So his blood had to be shed. There was no other way. In the same manner, he took the cup, and when he stopped saying, this cup is the New Testament, my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show for the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. And as best as we can, Lord, we seek to honor you here this morning and to remember what you've done for us. 
we love you, Lord, and we, we do love you as much as we can, but we thank you for loving us so much more, Lord, that your sacrifice is so complete. Thank you for being our propitiation. Thank you for being the final payment. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. Would you stand with me? The words of the song say, and so with thankfulness and faith we rise. So with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to
Gracious Father, we thank you again for, for loving us, Lord, for sending your Son to die on the cross and pay the price for us, Lord. As we enter into that season of uh, Advent, Lord, enter into that season of uh, celebrating uh, your nativity, your birth, it's hard to believe that, Lord, you came as a child and to die as a man for sinful men. Yet, Lord, here we are, uh, the recipients of your grace and your mercy. And, Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for loving us. So guide us, Lord, to walk in your ways and to please you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give. God bless you guys. I pray that your day is filled with just uh, thoughts of him and uh, the remembrance of what he's done for you, that he fills you to overflowing with his Holy Spirit, that you walk in the Spirit, deny the lust of the flesh, and uh, you just have that cheesy grin on your face all day long because you've got Jesus in your heart and you're headed to heaven. God bless you guys. Have a great day. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. Myself and the elders, we would love to pray with you. <laughs> Hey, Jeff.